to talk to Uh, the, they always say the, the screen's good for the one more.
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's meeting. Welcome to the Area Committee. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to pass to the clerk, Pauline, and she'll take you through the procedural issues for the meeting and the sedent. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to give members a brief overview of the system, I know that you've all had your training, but um, just to say, you press the microphone if you're in the room to request to speak, and obviously remotely you'll ask, you'll press the button to speak also. This will be queued, and the Chair or the Clerk will activate as necessary. Um, if you could please press the microphone again to switch off after speaking. Um, for those participating remotely, if you need to get a message to the clerk or chair, for example, when raising a point of order, please use the chat button. There is a chat facility. Um, also, for those re participating remotely, we've become aware that there can be a delay between your microphone being activated and you being heard in the chamber, so I would ask you to be aware of that. Um, the meeting will be recorded as well as live streamed to be made available on the Council's YouTube channel. When a member has made a declaration of interest, you are required to leave the meeting prior to consideration of that item. And if you could please advise at that stage that you're leaving the meeting, that would be really helpful. For those participating remotely, you'll be sent a text, email or Teams message advising when you can rejoin the meeting. Um, also for those participating remotely, if you lose connection or have any technical issues during the meeting, um, if you could contact the clerk's assistant by text if possible, um, the mobile number for that is, and I'll say this quite slowly, so if you want to jot it down, 07 and contact will be made with colleagues in IT for assistance. The assistant will begin recording and live streaming the meeting, so I'm just waiting for confirmation of that happening. Yep, um, it's been confirmed that that is happening. So with your permission, Chair, I'll take this adherent for the area committee of the 10th of August 2022. I see that Councillor Bradley is participating, that Councillor Brogan is here in the room, as is Councillor Brown. Councillor Calicus is participating remotely. Councillor Cowan is here at the meeting. Councillor Cowie is participating remotely, as is Councillor Fulton. Councillor Lennon. No, I don't see anything from Councillor Lennon. Councillor Loudon is participating. Councillor Nugent is also here. Councillor Ray is here. And I have apologies intimated on behalf of Councillor Walker. So with that, Chair, I'll hand back to you for the business of the meeting. Thanks, Pauline. OK, we'll move to item one in the agenda, declarations of interest. Do we have any? OK, thank you. We'll move to item two. Do we have any questions or comments on the previous minutes? OK, thank you. I'll move them as a correct record. And we'll move to item three on the agenda. It's items for noting, presentation by Police Scotland. And I'd like to welcome Chief Inspector Stephen McGovern and Inspector Kevin Miller. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, can I start off by uh, saying how good it is to be back in person at meetings and meeting um, the councillors in person. Um, I'm Stephen McGovern, um, Local Area Commander for Rutherglen and Cambus Lang uh, locality, joined today by Inspector Kevin Miller, Local Area Inspector for the locality. Um, we are responsible for the community policing and the response policing team um, based within Rutherglen Police Station and responsible for the policing, as I say, for Sorry, my mic's gone yet. Um, we are supporting... We are supported also by local and national specialist officers. Um, those officers are based across Lanarkshire and further wide um, within Scotland as a whole. Um, we are responsible for ensuring the local policing priorities um, within the locality, um, which includes um, reducing violence and disorder, um, public protection, and tackling housebreaking, acquisitive crime, and reducing the harm caused by substance misuse. Um, this plan is currently in place for the years 2020 to 2023 and has currently um, started the consultation period moving forward um, for the forthcoming three years, which will commence in April the 1st, 2023. Um, that consultation is ongoing through the 
your police survey, um, which is available online, and we will aim to circulate that um, to those um, local residents within the communities um, and hope that you can support us um, in that manner. Also, by influencing your opinion on what the, the um, priority should be for the forthcoming year. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, similar to all of um, partner organisations, um, the last two years or so um, have been incredibly challenging um, during COVID. Um, however, following um, the restrictions being reduced, um, we have began to recommence our face-to-face -face meetings um, gradually. Um, however, this did not stop our business as usual meetings during um, the pandemic where we were able to meet um, online and through other means, um, MS Teams, etc. However, as we move forward, we are looking to um, recommence our, our meetings face to face, um, both in terms of our partners and uh, members of the public um, in relation to that. The service provision um, from other partners and third sector organisations um, duly altered um, during COVID. Um, similarly, the demand um, on policing um, altered also, um, a, a hugely ch challenging period for ourselves, um, where you'll see on the slide the, the latest statistics indicated that over 73% of the incidents which um, Police Scotland received nationally um, lead to no crime being recorded, um, which indicates that the demand from non-crime matters uh, placed upon um, police locally um, within our locality and nationally is quite considerable. Um, in terms of our partnership working, um, it is hugely valued and our local officers continue um, to liaise with partners within our community, um, share information, um, seeking to detect and deter and prevent crime where possible, um, seeking to improve the locality and seeking to help those um, who need the help and support through other partners. And, and that um, varies through our local authority partners within housing, anti-social investigation, um, the social work department, um, our local schools, um, where at present, um, within the three secondary schools in the locality, um, at Cathkin, Stonelaw and Trinity, we now have a school-based officer in each of those schools, um, which both we, from a policing perspective, and from feedback from the schools and the head teachers um, there at those campuses, um, find hugely beneficial. Um, speaking about that partnership work um, that on, is ongoing and has been ongoing, to meet through the community safety um, weekly hub meetings, um, where with those partners, local authority, anti-social and Scottish and fire and rescue service, um, again, continue to identify problematic tenants, hotspot locations, um, and seek to, through joint tasking and a partnership approach, tackle those local issues um, that we experience um, within the community. I'm going to pass on to Kevin now um, to cover some of the highlights over the last year um, in terms of specific matters um, where we've intervened and worked in partnership, um, working on some of those local policing priorities that I've, I've raised. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would just like to run through some of the work carried out uh, in line with the local priorities, as uh, the Chief Inspector has said. So under a heading of reducing violence and disorder, as most of you will know, we've had a small number of incidents of youth disorder, um, which uh, have in the lead up to the summer holidays in the Burnside and Stonelaw Woods area. Unfortunately, this resulted in two youths being seriously assaulted with weapons in the area. We put in place a dedicated policing plan with additional patrols, high visibility foot patrols, combined with national resources such as the mounted uh, resources and the scrambler bikes, violence reduction scrambler bikes in the area. There was a total of four crimes committed in the months of May to June in the Burnside and Stonelaw area, and I'm, I'm happy to say that all four were detected. Two youths were arrested and charged with serious assault. One youth, youth was charged with disorder and possession of an offensive weapon, and a further three youths were charged with a common assault. 
There's a lot of work went on in the background as well. There was a number of diversionary uh, inputs took place delivered to the local secondary schools. There was multimedia agencies took place with partners in social work, health, education and youth workers in order to tackle the issues. Uh, happy to say there was no inc incidents of youth disorder reported in the area whilst the action plan was in force and it ran for a period of four weeks. Uh, next slide, please. Under public protection, um, I'd highlight some, some good results here. Uh, there was good work by local officers who carried out an uh, extensive CCTV inquiry following a 94-year-old woman having her handbag snatched in Main Street in Rutherglen in March this year. The suspect was a 45-year-old female. She was identified and arrested and charged with a robbery. Bail conditions were granted, which prohibited her from attending uh, Rutherglen Main Street, which have been enforced since uh, the incident took place. Uh, also under public protection, we, we do respond to a number of speeding complaints that we re receive via the community and from elected members themselves. Um, areas of concern have been proactively policed by community officers in conjunction with our road policing unit. Uh, we've targeted speeding in the Rutherglen and Canberra Slang area and we've had at least three specific days of action in the last couple of months, which resulted in one driver arrested for uh, driving under the influence of drugs and numerous speeding offences detected. This is something that we're going to continue doing and I've got plans in place for later on this month as well. Next slide, please. Under housebreaking and acquisitive crime, yeah, there's been some good work carried out by officers who traced and arrested a 17-year-old male from Glasgow as being responsible for part of a housebreaking gang who broke into the secondary schools of Stonelaw and Trinity yeah, on the morning of New Year's Day, along with Tory Glen Primary as well. There was some robust reporting in conjunction with partners and that resulted in this male being remanded in a secure children's unit following his appearance at court. Also, further good work to highlight uh, for local officers who identified a 24-year-old male for theft by housebreaking and seven crimes where he was found in locations where it could be inferred that he was intent on in committing further acts of theft in a residential area of Canberra Lang. This male was identified following extensive uh, inquiry where ring doorbell footage, private and public space CCTV was viewed from residents and he was remanded in custody. Uh, just on to the final slide. Uh, under reducing harm caused by substance misuse, um, I'd like to highlight a few good results we've had recently um, in the lo locality where a warrant was executed at an address in Rutherglen and we discovered a cannabis cultivation of over 300 plants with a street value of £130,000. A male suspect was traced hiding in the loft area and was arrested and kept custody for that offence. Uh, and there was also a significant drugs recovery in September 2021, which following on from the arrest of a 66-year-old male in London who was found in possession of 60 kilograms of Class A drugs. He was conveying them to Scotland. In partnership with our colleagues in the Metropolitan Police, a further 17 kilograms of cannabis and heroin was recovered from a search of his home address in the Rutherglen area. This resulted in a substantial quantity of drugs taken off the streets in the locality. And that, that's very much a partnership approach with our DAVRI team. We act on intelligence from partners, intelligence from community, community intel, which allows us to develop packages to, to take these quantities of drugs off the streets. Uh, just next slide, please. And the, that opens the floor to any questions. Any questions? Robert. Yes, thanks very much. Thanks very much for the presentation to both of you for me. Can I ask Inspector Miller for me on the youth crime thing in Burnside, if you now feel you're on top of the matter? I think there's been no further arrests or incidents. There has been occasional reports of people, you know, groups of um, kids, sometimes with weapons and all that, occasionally, I think, ongoing too. Do you have the feeling you're on top of it now? Thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor. Uh, yes, well, well, as part of our daily review, we review the incidents that, that occur every uh, in the previous 24 hours. Uh, happy to say that, that there have, have been a very small number of incidents in the Burnside area, but not related to youth disorder. Thankfully, we do get the odd occasional uh, stones getting thrown, minor antisocial behaviour. But in terms of the, the kind of uh, incidents that we'd seen prior to the summer holidays, I'm happy to say that uh, we don't have incidents on that scale. And the proactive policing has, I certainly think, displaced the numbers of, of groups of youths that were, were gathering in the area. We're also working with partners in the council as well. We've identified drinking dens that they had in the Stone Law Woods areas, and we've, through working with the council, we've managed to get them cleared away, which is having a positive impact. And also through the media as well, that re residents are aware and they're 
they're quite good at reporting things to us now. As soon as they see a group of youths, we'll get a phone call about it. It doesn't necessarily mean that that group of youths are, are going to engage in antisocial behaviour, but it allows us to act. If we've got a, a car in the, in the area, officers and foot, they can go and speak to them and, and take preventative work. Yes. Thanks very much. First of all, I wanted to thank you all for the um, efforts were made there. I think it was a good example of successful policing, and I think it was um, well appreciated by a lot of people in the local area and by the local elected representatives as well. I wanted to ask one other thing on a slightly different note, which was the demand from non-crime matters that uh, Stephen McGovern talked about before. Um, that seems a very high percentage, but I assume, it, does that include people who have committed or situations where there's been a crime committed but nobody identified? Or, I mean, what sort of things is it? it, it I don't imagine pol police are being called just for nothing, as it were. What sort of events are we getting in, involved there? Thank you. No, absolutely, Councillor Brown. No, that's an instance where we attend and through inquiry establish that there has been no crime committed whatsoever. So it can be anything from uh, a parking complaint um, where there's no crime attached to it, we have to provide advice and assistance. It could be a neighbour dispute again where there's no um, requirement for any crime report to be raised and again it's advice assistance given to both residents. It can be missing people which um, is a, a major factor in our daily business, um, tracing and uh, locating missing people safe and well. It can be vulnerable people um, who may be not quite missing um, but um, in a, a moment of crisis, situation of crisis, where we have to intervene as a first point of contact and engage with uh, partners to provide that ongoing support, whether it's initially through hospital, uh, the, the distress brief intervention mechanisms, and subsequent follow-up through health and social services. Andrea. Hi, um, thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask about... Um, Rutherglen Main Street. Um, I'm new to being a councillor, just elected in May, but during my campaigning when I was chapping doors, um, the youth disorder in Rutherglen Main Street, I, I, at least 10 different people um, independently asked what we were going to do about it. It's a real issue. And I heard a story about a woman who um, was almost knocked over by a 12-year-old on a bike. And when she sort of said, oh, you know, um, he then turned around and rammed the bicycle into her, you know, and this sort of thing. She, she now won't go back to Rutherglen Main Street. Um, and I know that you said about the CCTV, um, but my understanding is that the quality of the CCTV is not very high on Rutherglen Main Street. Um, and I just wondered, it's great that you've clear, cleaned up Burnside, if you like, um, but, you know, Rutherglen Main Street, um, and they hang around at that end of the Main Street between the Witherspoons pub and the Millcroft um, and I've seen them myself, so I just wondered if you could tell me what is, is you know, what activity is going on around that. Thank you. Um, if I would be obliged to answer that one. So in, in relation to the, the point um, regarding CCTV, so there is um, a limited CCTV on the main street itself. We do have the opportunity through tasking, um, through the antisocial investigation team, where we have the mobile CCTV unit. Um, and routinely um, on a Wednesday at the meetings, um, we request that for specific areas um, within the locality based on where we foresee um, the, the current demand being um, and where we require that, that tasking process process to be um, required. Um, the local authority, South Lancashire Council, are very good in supporting us in, in relation to that. Um, in terms of the policing of the main street itself, um, we are fortunate in the location of the police station, um, which isn't um, too far from the main street itself. Um, our officers frequently in uh, going back and forth within the locality of Rutherland and Cambus Lang um, are on the main street, both in terms of patrol vehicles um, and our local community officers um, in terms of being on foot. Um, so uh, we do actively um, patrol the main street itself, um, both in terms of our local officers and in terms of national um, officers as well, in terms of that support. Um, I'm aware that Inspector Miller has requested the support of mounted officers, which we've had um, on the main street itself at times, um, and other um, national uh, resources as well, supporting us in terms of um, that response and, and that visibility. Um, what also may go unnoticed is at times we do have officers who are not 
not in uniform um, patrolling the main street. Um, Kevin referred to our alcohol and violence reduction unit officers where we have got the opportunity to put them into plain clothes um, to patrol the areas to try and detect those who may be consuming alcohol in public places, those who may be consuming um, drugs in public places or indeed um, passing it to others. Um, so we do uh, have a variation in terms of deployment of our officers um, to try and mitigate against that. Um, I think the, the concern I th that I really have is that some of these youths are very young. Um, and I just wonder, you know, if, if there's any special way of, of dealing with those and maybe engaging with them. I, you know, I don't know if that's a police job. Maybe that's maybe that's not the police's job. But a lot of them are, you know, 11, 12 years of age um, on bikes. You know, they, they seem to be a real issue. No, absolutely. Um, and that, that's a point that Kevin made um, previously to Councillor Brown in relation to Burnside that um, I was going to pick up on. I've noted it down. So in the two years of the pandemic, um, unfortunately, our prevention um, methods and approaches within the, the, the schools, the secondary schools, where the ages of these kids would have been picked up on um, in their, their their first years of school, they would have had those presentations from our school-based officers in terms of uh, weapon carrying, knife crime, um, misuse of alcohol, etc. We've missed a, a two-year gap, if you like, of that. Um, thankfully, in March of this year, we were able to start going back into the schools. Um, we now have the three school-based officers there. And from next Wednesday, um, those three officers will be back in our secondary schools and ultimately trying to play catch-up with the, the two years that have been missed, um, catching the new first years as they start and coming into the school, and furthermore, trying to catch up on the, the second and third year and probably now fourth-year pupils um, that we've missed out on. So there's a programme of activity planned out for those school-based officers to try and capture that. But furthermore, in terms of the partnership approach um, with um, our anti-social investigation team, our social work department, um, these individuals who we come into contact with, those details um, are shared through information sharing protocols where we look at that joined up approach and look at that intervention um, and any other methods um, to try and keep them away from the criminal justice system and subsequent enforcement. Martin. Hi, so is that me speaking on those that are Thanks, Martin. Um, yes. Um, so what I was hoping to ask, um, just a wee bit of kind of kind of guidance regarding a particularly difficult situation that our constituent made me aware of, um, where someone who's kind of new to Rutherland experiencing some kind of race kind of racially motivated or aggravated um antisocial behaviour, um, including some really quite potentially dangerous rumours being spread about them. Um now obviously I've given this constituent the kind of standard advice that we do about making sure they keep a um a thorough log of all the incidents and making sure they're um diligent in terms of reporting it to the police. Um but I wonder if there are if there are any more concrete steps that really can be taken, um, because I think they're, they're in a, a relatively difficult situation as it stands. Thank, thanks, Councillor Lynn. Uh, yeah, in relation to, to hate crime, it's something that's obviously high on our agenda. And if uh, someone has been the victim of hate crime, we would encourage them to report it to the police in the first instance. We'll carry out a thorough investigation in, in line with the criminal justice system. We'll, we'll put, put, put measures in place to ensure that the victim is prioritising the hate crime. In relation to incidents that happen in the, in the locality, if it's uh, if it's a, it stems from a neighbour dispute or some uh, something local, then we'll also uh, share information with our colleagues via the South Lanarkshire Hub meeting to take action uh, in relation to um, anything that, we, that, that the partners can bring to the table to ensure that the safety and the well-being of the, the victim in the hate crime. So I would uh, really encourage him to get in touch or her to get in touch with, with the police and report it to us. Brilliant. And the, the other thing, just kind of in response to um, what I think Count, Councillor Cowan was kind of bringing up, there are there's some good work um, being carried out by Universal Connections, I know, in relation to the particular issues of that side of the main street and the, the antisocial behaviour from young people there. Um, I know the police have had some of their suggestions about how to deal with it. 
some which have been really helpful um, in my previous dealings, some which have not been particularly helpful. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a, a multi-agency um, approach that's been taken to solve it. So hopefully, hopefully some progress is being made. Margaret. Thanks very much for all the work being done in the Burnside area. Um, what a difference being a landlord was in a lot of time, but what happened was pretty serious. So well done, Kevin and the team. Um, also wanted to ask for a re update on Spring Hall. I know it has been pretty quiet, but I've been hearing wee bits and pieces about um, buses being hit for faults and a wee bit of youth disorder around about the shops again. Um, and my third question was to do with rates. I'm hearing about a lot of kids, 8, 9, 10, that are walking about openly using rates. Is there any law against it? What action can be taken, if any? You know, as kids stop that are seen using them in a how do you go about finding out where the bottom? Thanks, if somebody could answer that. Thank you, Councillor uh, Kerry. I'll just uh, touch on Spring Hall, first of all. Um, yes, um, we, we do have, we've obviously, you know, the, the, the beat officer there, and we've got uh, a neighbour for Ryan now who'll be starting soon. So he, he did have neighbours in the past, but he's got a regular neighbour now for that area. I did notice myself a, a, a slight increase in the number of calls in around the shops in Spring Hall for youth disorder. And, and thankfully, they've been reported for it by the sh shopkeepers themselves. Uh, and it was, it was fairly low level antisocial behaviour, throwing stones, etc. So it's something that we're looking to build into our, our local patrol plans at evenings and weekends and peak times to try and, and target the, the youths responsible for, for that particular behaviour. Um, in relation to the, the vapes, uh, I believe uh, that uh, well, certainly my officers have taken vapes off of persons under the age of 16, taken them back to their parents and informed them that, that they're carrying these vapes, they shouldn't really have them. Um, there has been some engagement with local shopkeepers as well in relation to the selling of vapes, and I think that information gets fed back through to our, our licensing department as well so that they can take any action necessary. Janine? Yep, thanks Councillor Cleeks, that's really much appreciated, um, absolutely, um, Kevin and uh, Sergeant Scott Hunter, um, local community sergeant based at Rullergan as well, um, for the locality, um, will absolutely um, meet in person, take emails, take telephone calls and trying to resolve matters at the earliest possible opportunity because we recognise that's the best way um, to, to work in and not in isolation but we'll do it in conjunction um, with, with partners um, in, a, in a previous um, update there, a question from Councillor Lennon, he mentioned Universal Connections um, absolutely first class in terms of a, a third sector organisation who we work um, with um, as, as well as many others um, who are in the community and again, given the, the pandemic, um, these TSOs are um, now starting to re-establish themselves, which hopefully we will start to see the benefits as well um, moving forward um, into the, the forthcoming period. Thank you. Do we have any further questions? 
Okay. Um, I, would, I did pass on my thanks um, prior to the meeting starting, but just to say it formally and echo the comments that have already been made, um, I really do appreciate the work that has gone in on Burnside and Rutherglen and the fact that the elected members were kept so up to date. So again, just a formal thank you from myself and thank you for the presentation today. Okay, we'll now move on to agenda item number four. Partic I never say this correctly, so we're just going to say PB footpaths and I'll pass over to Colin Park. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, and I'll just kind of continue that as well. We'll just call it PB from now on as well. So, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the purpose of this report is to advise the Area Committee of the outcome and level of engagement for the participated budgeting, or PB as we now call it, exercise to identify 2.5 million uh, of footway projects uh, and the next steps uh, moving forward. So a wee bit of background. This is a kind of paper for the whole of South Lanarkshire, uh, but as members will have noted, there's a, there's a focused uh, area in Appendix, I think it's Appendix 6 at the very end in terms of Rutherland Ruther Canvas Lang. So following the, the PB investment exercise that was undertaken in 21-22, this second phase of investment is now underway and it's been uh, agreed with a focus on footways, which was uh, feedback we received last year as well. And this, this is foot, footways that are part of the adopted road network as well. At paragraph 3.3, we identify there that, as was the case last year, we've split the funding ge 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 geographically and operation into operational areas, and it's largely based upon the estimated footwork, footway network length. And if you look at the table underneath paragraph 3.3, you'll see that Rutherland Canvas Line received just under 430,000. Paragraph 3.5, it just outlines what the public were asked to vote upon, and they were asked to vote on uh, three themes. Uh, minor and residential footways uh, been one, main and distributor footways been another, and footways and business areas been the final one. Uh, in terms of 4.1, that just outlines that the consultation ran between the 22nd of April to the 5th of June, and it was promoted via the usual channels, the Council's website, so, social media, and uh, third sector networks as well. Moving down to paragraphs 4.6 and 4.7. Uh, 4.6, it just notes that Appendix 1 sets out the results of the vote with the numbers of votes cast. Uh, and importantly, what it hi highlights is a consistent picture uh, across all of the kind of four areas. Uh, it was identified that the first place theme was minor and residential footways, followed by main and distributor footways, and then footways and business areas as well. And from our own understanding, our own evidence, our own, our own knowledge, uh, that's what we feel is coming through from el el elected members and our, our communities over the last number of years. Paragraph uh, 4.7 just notes the quality of inf information is set out in Appendix 2. And underneath that, you'll see kind of various uh, elements that are discussed in terms of the number of respondents, kind of work, the working age, caring responsibilities, etc. as well. Moving down to section five, in line with the results of the vote, the funding has been allocated uh, as set out in that table underneath paragraph 5.1. And you'll see there that in Rutherglen and Canvas Line, there was just over a quarter of a million went towards the first place theme, which you remember was uh, footways and residential areas, then 106,000 to the second place theme and the final balance of 64,000 to the third place theme. Appendix three to six sets out the details, the specific locations and, and the indicative sums. Uh, and those schemes have been identified uh, from our own kind of own local knowledge as officers, uh, our own kind of assessment criteria, uh, and essentially it, tie, it ties in with our own local knowledge. And it was quite heartening to see that uh, some of the themes that were emerging were also tying up with the local officers who, who knew their patch. So Appendix 6 uh, does set out uh, the details of the Rutherland Campus Lang area. And again, happy to take questions at the very end there. Paragraph 5.6 uh, just kind of notes again that given our already full and challenging workload, uh, we have started these works uh, already uh, just to kind of maintain the momentum in the, in the programming of works. As some of you may know, we've had, had a, cha a challenge in terms of supply chain, bitumen availability as well. So those, those works have, have commenced and they'll continue between now and the end of the financial year. Uh, 5.9 just notes that uh, obviously the, this report you're hearing today, this has been the first one of the four area committees, and this is a, a, a paper for noting uh, because the budget allocation has already been agreed as part of the budget setting process. Section 7 uh, just kind of covers some of the financials. Uh, so the intention is to spend the full 2.5 million this year. Uh, however, there are market conditions I've touched upon already that may result in some of the funding moving into 23 24. 
Uh, that doesn't mean the projects won't go ahead. They just they'll just go ahead a, a little later. But every effort has been made to actually try and deliver all of the works during this financial year. Uh, turning back to the, rec the recommendations at section two, which we'll just return to, the committee is asked to approve the following recommendations: that the outcome and level of engagement for the PB consultation exercise to identify 2.5 million of footway projects uh, be noted. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Colin. Okay, we'll open it up to questions. Nope, don't see any hands. Are we happy to agree the reports? Thank you. Okay, we'll move to agenda item five, and it is John McCafferty, who will be taking us through the neighbourhood planning update. Thanks, John. The report is to give an update on the the work and neighbourhood planning in the Camaslang and Rolligan area. Um, and just, I think it's useful to say that in terms of the background, uh, paragraph three, that there is a statutory responsibility on councils and community planning partnerships to identify these areas. That may be useful, I think, for perhaps new members of the, of the committee to understand that, that there's a lot of statistical analysis done and those priority areas are identified. And obviously, South Lanarkshire, we've been doing a lot of that work since um, primarily 2017, where the first three areas were identified, um, including Spring Hall and Whitleyburn, which is obviously neighbourhood planning work for a considerable time. Um, we, we have now expanded that work uh, to include other areas in Hamilton, but in, in terms of Camus Lang and Rolgan, there is also the um, Camus Lang East uh, and Burnhill and Fernhill, which is a fairly new one today. Um, and we, as part of this report, we hopefully you'll notice the, our glossy uh, <laughs> um, progress reports from each of the areas. Now, obviously, these are deliberately designed to be user friendly and community friendly, um, and, and hopefully, people will, will read them and will understand what we're saying. And obviously, we're, we're, we're obviously very happy with the, the progress to date with the, the various neighbourhood planning areas, but just to highlight a couple of particular things, and I think very much touching on what the, the police were saying today, Spring Hall and Whitleyburn, that youth disorder issue around the shops really was concerning for the community and for the neighbourhood planning group. There was a subgroup formed, and I think it's really important to note that it's been a whole community approach has been taken to the issue. Yes, there's got to be the actual reporting of the issues, there's got to be police action taken, but I think universal connections, schools and voluntary sector activity, I think, is really um, coming together. It's a great example of partnership example um, work in Spring Hall and Whitleyburn, and that's highlighted in the report. In Burnhill, I think, um, again, everybody would hopefully recognise that the work around the highbacks, and that that's always been a particular area of, and issue for, for the council and the community. And I think it's great work with the community um, pulling together to look at developing the, the high backs, that space, as a community space and a community garden. There's been some issues, some technical issues and some planning issues around it and some neighbour issues, but, but we really think that the community has really got that on board and is really moving that forward. And Camus Lang and East, uh, Camus Lang East um, obviously, particularly through COVID, it's not always been easy to get that neighbourhood engagement often. And I think Camus Lang East really sort of focused on some of the outdoor work as soon as they could get back together again. And I think the, the work on the kind of joint partnership work in Halfway Park and also the Lightburn Early, Early Learning Centre, the community garden there, I think that's a great example of moving forward with uh, that neighbourhood plan. And as I say, Fernhill is the latest area that's been identified as a neighbourhood plan. And this is really interesting. I'd like to make a wee, a wee contrast there. The Fernhill community, when we started to talk to them, just after first year of COVID, really, really didn't want to engage. So it was a, quite a, an elderly population that were mostly involved. And they basically said, can we, can, can we get over COVID as much as possible first before we do that that face-to-face -face engagement and really get around the community? So. Uh, we weren't doing so much online in Fernhill, and it's really just been the last um, six months 
that the, the, our team has really worked with the local community to identify the priorities for Fernhill. So they've just done, gone through the process of identifying the, the, the priorities that they wish to tackle through the neighbourhood plan. And I'll contrast that with Spring Hall Whitleburn again, where we actually found that the online engagement actually produced a, a range of new people who wanted to be engaged in the process. Younger people, people with families that perhaps had other responsibilities and couldn't come to face-to-face uh, -face meetings. So it's, you know, there's, we, we have to recognise that each community is different and there has to be a different approach. But obviously a lot of the common issues are there. And as I say, we're, we're pleased with the, the development of the, of the plans as, as they stand at the moment. We think that each, each group is identifying the key areas and key issues and also taking them forward with partners, with, with the voluntary sector locally and recognise that the community have to be directly involved in this work and have to take a lot of these things forward. Uh, in terms of future plans in, in Section 5, um, obviously we wish to strengthen all of the neighbourhood planning areas across South Lanarkshire and we want to work with the local groups. We want to identify the issues and we want to try and tackle it completely in tandem and in conjunction with those communities the issues that have been identified. Um, as these neighbourhood planning areas increase, and obviously there is a resource issue there, um, but as they increase, we hope we're starting to get a kind of conglomerate of issues uh, produced across South Lanarkshire, but also within our localities. And I just want to highlight that there is a new kind of fledgling community partnership for each of the four localities, and Canvas Lang Rulligan is very much leading the way on that, and that's very much aimed at community representatives coming together to identify the sort of common issues across the area, not just the, the locality, and they will feed that, those issues back into the community planning partnership. So there will be a report uh, hopefully going in September about the community partnerships, and I think particularly uh, a good update on the Canvas Lang and Rolog Community Partnership, which, as I say, is very much leading the way. So finally, can I just say, uh, members, that uh, if the recommendation is that the progress being made in respect to neighbourhood planning is noted and that the annual reports produced are noted. Thank you. Thank you, John. OK, we'll open it up to questions. Norman. Uh, hi, uh, thanks. I was just wondering, uh, 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 just to clarify it on, on what you were talking about at the end there, I, I'm getting, uh, excuse my ignorance, but I'm getting a bit confused about the community partnership and the community planning partnership and quite where the distinction lies in, uh, uh, there. Councillor, it's a very legitimate question. You know, this is this is a new concept. There's very much the community planning partnership. Obviously, is the the major agencies in South Lanarkshire that, that discuss the the common priorities. The new council plan and community plan have just been produced very much in tandem with each other. And I think it's fair to say that um, while Vaslan, our, our, our voluntary sector interface, are a formal partner in the community planning partnership, there isn't that engagement with communities. And, and it's fair to say. That that's probably historical across Scotland, that community planning partnerships don't have an easy engagement with the community. And let's be honest, if you stopped someone in the street and said, what is the community planning partnership? I'd be very surprised that they would tell you, be able to tell you what it is. So the theory here is that um, these community, the neighbourhood planning areas, community councils, the community representatives that are actively involved will come together as a grouping. Our team, the community engagement team, will support them. They'll look at the issues as a, as I say, a conglomerate. A Clydesdale Community Partnership, not surprisingly, is already beginning to look at community transport in the area as a potential issue. But it's very early days for these community partnerships. The principle, they are, the ambition is there, but I have to be honest that quite often the community also have that confusion sometimes about how this all fits together. And I think just, I just want to stress that very early days but we're heartened, particularly in Camus Lang and Rolligan, with the way the community partnership has started and the involvement and engagement from communities in that process. Katie? Okay, thanks, Carol. 
Um, I, I won't linger over the point about mentioning um, individual projects, but just to touch um, on the points that were made about the fantastic work that's happened in, in our wards, the community garden with the nations, and it's really starting to come to fruition after the, the hard work that's happened over the past few years, including obviously the difficult pandemic and years from now, right in the midst of it. Um, I would, however, let's take a moment to uh, thank the community planning team more generally. Um, and the responsiveness and the updates that they've given us on projects that are happening at board and throughout the summer as well and how quick they are to respond to questions and inquiries that we put in and also, and I think perhaps most importantly, their proactiveness and contacting us when they have opportunities or, or information which you think are of interest to, to groups in their area which we can pass on to people, I think that is really important and it's something that's definitely appreciated over the last few months. Thanks, Ben. Roberts. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, just really off, off to one side of that, I, I think one of the difficulties I think now is the lack and decline of residence groups and tenant associations in many of the areas. I think we've got very little left by way of infrastructure that way. That makes it difficult to get community representatives in the, in the traditional fashion. And I wondered if one of the products of community planning and, the, and the, the local plans and all that was to perhaps look at whether you could leave behind you sustainable community groups of one sort or another, when that's part of the actual mission that you want to see accomplished here. And if so, can you give us any insight as to how that might be gone about? Yeah, honestly, that's that's one of our fundamental reasons for, for carrying out this work. I mean, one of the things that is always attractive is, and I'll also say PB, there is a local PB pot for each of those communities, and it's the communities that vote on those priorities. Now, to be honest, as soon as as soon as anyone expresses an interest in being involved in a PB process or in the neighbourhood plan, we kind of sign them up. We kind of say, oh, you want to be involved. So we, we, we also, we do appreciate that if there aren't formal community groups already established, it's to try and get perhaps new blood and try and get some of that community voice. So we do try and encourage folk and sign folk up through all those processes to be involved in the neighbourhood planning process. Obviously, it's, it's not always easy and it's not always easy to get a kind of wide demographic uh, involved, but it's, it's one of our kind of abiding principles that we try and involve as many people in, as possible in that neighbourhood planning group. Um, and that includes behind that, we, we often have a kind of stakeholder group where council resources and par partners are involved, but also local community organisations, vibrant community organisations, and, you know, and healthy and happy. And Canvas Land and Oligans is a very good example of an organisation we work very closely with in terms of the development of those plans. So, yes, it's difficult to, to get folk involved, but we, we, we do take as much chance as possible to do that. And, you know, when you look at the numbers, we're quite heartened with the level of engagement from the community. OK, I don't think we've got any further questions. Um, I'd just like to say, once again, I really do like the layout of the updates. I think they're very easy to read, easy to engage with and to get the key points across. I also like the slogan, Can Do Community. Um, and just thank you for coming along and the comprehensive update today, John. OK, we'll now move to item six on the agenda. That's community grant applications. The committee is asked to approve the following recommendation. Third Lanark Football Club and the recommendation is a £300 award. Do we have any questions or comments? Okay, I'll move the report. Can I have a seconder, please? Thanks, Andrea. Okay. I have no items of urgent business, but before we finish up, I would like to just record my thanks to Lynn Patterson. Um, some will know that Lynn is leaving the council on Friday. Um, she's been a great support to me as chair of this um, area committee for the last five years and she has brought a real wealth of knowledge so I just want to thank her for her hard work and to wish her all the best for the future. So thank you for your attendance and participation today and I'll close the meeting. Thank you.